the result because of his deep political connections. So if you look me up, you won't know that I played, you know, at the university. Um, and that's just kind of the way that it is. It's something that was accepted, you know, in terms of because of the politics and the patriarchy at play. And so I'm just grateful to my parents that when I did lose that scholarship to help me financially because working did, wasn't sufficient, you know, at the time for me to, to pay for my tuition. Fortunately, it wasn't much. It was very low tuition, you know, at that time. So, but yeah, I'm just grateful to my parents also in terms of how they raised me. Extended relatives, otherwise, you know, that's another story with regards to how extended relatives and the Iranian Persian community viewed me. But my parents, I'm grateful for my parents, like in the household and how that was. Um, I don't, because of time, I don't know if I should continue. I wanted to get into the nobility part, but, or if people were more interested in having this conversation because I want, I don't like being the type to talk all the time in jibber jabber. Everyone knows that I talk a lot already. So I just wanted to engage more in conversation. It's up to you all what you prefer. I was gonna share um, more in the nobility piece and how I connected to the nobility. I see Roya, thank you for the, what do you, Sharon, do you have your hand up? I do because um, I'd like to hear more from you actually as much as possible. And what you have to share with us is just extraordinary and uplifting to me. It's like a balm to soars uh, as a black woman to hear another woman from another culture talk so boldly and clearly and honestly. So I'd like to hear more from you. We can talk all the time among ourselves. Thank you so much for the love. I really appreciate it all. If anyone at any time objects or just be like, can you please stop? Just say, unmute yourself so I can. I can like be like, okay, let's have a conversation. Cause I like having conversations. I'm married to an introvert. So I often have conversations with myself which is not, you know, always ideal. <laughs> but so I just wanted to share a little bit more. Thanks for the love, Julia. Thanks for making it. I'm, I appreciate that the best coast people have joined cause I know it's early um, for you all. I call it best coast, I'm biased. So I call, you know, this part of the of the country, the least coast. I'm from the best coast. I'm from California, and then now I live in the Midwest, Indiana. That's what I call it, the Midwest. So I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to be funny with that. But I'm gonna share the screen again just to give you some ideas. So what happened was, I was diagnosed with PTSD. I had mentioned, and I didn't know what to do. And I was living in South Africa at the time. I'm still navigating my, my nobility or lack of understanding the sense of, of it and what it meant, especially within a context of being damaged and victim and labeled all these other things, right? Um, and so I had a session with my therapist who I was talking to, you know, via, via computer. And she said this most profound thing, but it was also so simple. And she said, why don't you, as soon as you wake up every morning, say a prayer to recognize your own nobility? I was like, mind blown. Say a prayer to recognize my own nobility? I was like, what? You know, I use, there are, you know, within the Baha'i tradition, it's very common to find, to say prayers for expected mothers, for families, for tests and difficulties, for service, for teaching, for the departed, for the ancestors. But to recognize my own nobility, I was like, what is that, you know? And, and so I did some searching and I looked through these mystic writings that the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah, had written in the Sufi tradition. And they're kind of directives, they're small directives, right? And they're called the hidden words. And there's, it's fragment, it's sectioned into two parts, the Arabic part, section, which were translated from Arabic into English, and then the Persian part, which were written in Persian originally and translated into, into English. And so these two hidden words are what I set myself to memory every, you know, every single morning before, until I memorized them and I just recited them every morning. Would anyone like to volunteer to please read the first hidden word? Read. Thank you. O oh, son of spirit, I created thee rich. Why dost thou bring thyself down to poverty? Noble I made thee. Wherewith dost thou abase thyself? 
out of the essence of knowledge I gave thee being. Why seekest thou enlightenment from anyone beside me? Out of the clay of love I molded thee. How dost thou busy thyself with another? Turn thy sight unto thyself, that thou mayest find me standing within thee, mighty, powerful, and self-subsisting. Thank you so much, Maria. So when I was reading this for the first time, I'm like, wait a minute. All I'm focusing on is my ignobility, my not being noble, right? My damage, my... I had this sense of self that was off center. I didn't look at myself as worthy because even though I was in an abusive relationship and I had a pattern of being in abusive relationships after, but not to the same degree, it only reflected also how I viewed myself and how my sense of self was perceived in order to allow myself to be in that kind of relationship and to allow someone to treat me that way, right? So it was my sense of nobility and the way that I was looking at this first hidden word was, I am distracting myself with my ignobility when all I could be focusing on is the fact that I am noble, right? That I am full of love and all these things. So it was really groundbreaking for me to look in the mirror and see these things that I didn't really conceive, even though they were my inherent spiritual reality, right? Could someone please read the second hidden word? I can. Thank you. O son of spirit, noble have I created thee, yet thou hast abased thyself. Rise then unto that for which thou wast created. Thank you. So we were created noble, born noble, and this goal applies to every single person. It applies to everybody. Everyone is created noble, born inherently noble. And to be able to think about this idea within the context of violence and oppression, racial injustice, patriarchy, sexual violence, gender-based discrimination, to think about all these things and say that you are noble despite all these things that they still happen. And so that was a question I was navigating with myself. How do we focus on visibilizing our nobility, our respective nobility, without delegitimizing oppression that happens, right? Because when I was called victim, when I'm called damaged, when the discourse often focuses on the damage and the trauma of people without visibilizing their nobility at the same time, it's invisibilizing their nobility. And that's how I felt I was invisibilized in that context of being damaged. But even in spaces that focus on racial justice scholarship and activism and discourses, I found that this idea of damage um, and all this stuff was being centered all the time, right? And so the fact that you are created noble, it was very humbling for me to be able to memorize this, but also how do I apply this in every aspect of my life at the same time, right? Like, how do I live this? And I'm still learning because it's not something that you do overnight, you know? And then it made me think of this idea of nobility and how justice is a noble quality and injustice and iniquity. And this is from the perfect exemplar of the Baha'i faith, Abdul Baha, who also happens to be um, the son of the prophet under the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah. And so justice is a noble quality. It is a quality that is noble. It is a quality of the soul. If you know, thinking about these ideas in terms of the relationship and thinking about injustice not being noble, right? And so it, it, it made me want to think more about this idea and how we engage in the discourse. And so that's why the title is what it is, you know, if justice is this noble quality, what is true nobility? What does that mean? And how do we focus on this duality of, one thing I was noticing is that you know, we visibilize trauma and we invisibilize nobility. We don't do both. You can talk about the oppression. I don't think we should erase or deny or mute it, or a lot of people already do that. And that's, that's an injustice as well. But how do we talk about the oppression 
without dehumanizing people to just being damaged bodies, just to belittling, um, diminishing people to damaged bodies, right? And so when gender comes into play, it also becomes this hyper visibility that sometimes because of your gender and whatever particular race, racial group like, like um, the reference to misogynoir, right? This idea of the black woman, the exotic, she's hypersexualized. She's hyper visible in that kind of, kind of stereotype or that trope, right? This idea of the Jezebel, these kind of ideas or even indigenous women that are, you know, are only good for sex. And I'll talk about where that's coming from in terms of these ideas, but how do we talk about and shifting beyond this idea of damaged? And why do us, um, people who are, have experienced abusive relationships, why do we have to still be reminded through the language of the policies and the scholarship and the activism that we are still holding the burden, we are still being beaten, even if symbolically, right? By using language like battered women's syndrome or violence against women. How does our nobility become centered in those kind of conversations and actions? And so this importance of the idea of the spirit and how it's the most noble of phenomenon and thinking about this idea of the soul when Abdu'l-Bahá says, in the world of existence, there is nothing so important as spirit, nothing so essential as the spirit of man. The spirit of man is the most noble of phenomena, the collective center of all human virtues, the cause of the illumination of this world. So imagine if all of us were like nuclei of, of no, like souls, like imagine if we just perceive one another like that. This idea of nuclei of virtues, of nobility, of justice. But that often becomes muted and erased and invisibilized, especially when talking about issues of you know, damage and trauma. And so like Eve Tuck, she's an indigenous scholar who talks in her article called Suspending Damage about we need to rewrite narratives and reconsider the danger and damage-centered narratives, right? because they're pathologizing us as native people, but also people who are often seen as marginalized or underserved. So oppression singularly defines a community. She, so I ask you to join me in revisioning research and representations in our communities, not only to recognize you know, the, the detrimental impact and effects and reality of oppression and injustice in the world, but also to consider ourselves as noble and not just damaged and broken, right? Um, and if anyone is interested in the slides later, I can share um, because like I said, I don't wanna jibber jabber too much. And it kind of just reminded me of this tweet that I, that I had seen a while ago, a long time ago, um, not a long time ago, but you know, months ago on this idea of the generational trauma. A lot of people talk about the generational trauma, but this reminder of not to focus on also the generational strengths, right, of the ancestors. And, and this idea of even makes me think of this Baha'i concept of constructive resilience, which I, we can get into when we have more time. Um, so in the Baha'i writings, people of African descent have this distinct station and status of being the pupil of the eye. Uh, the pupil of the eye anatomically, right, is it doesn't have um, a physical sense, but it's this portal of light. And this was, Abdu'l-Bahá had written this in particular in response to an African-American woman by the name of Sadie Oglesby and calling, saying, oh, thou who hast an illumined heart, thou art even as the pupil of the eye, the very wellspring of the light, for God's love hath cast its rays upon thine most inmost being, and thou hast turned thy face toward the kingdom of thy Lord. And Abdu'l-Bahá knew, being Persian, coming to the United States, not knowing English, speaking before a crowd of, you know, a racially mixed crowd, which was not even legal at the time, and saying, you all need to get together and, and um, you know, integrate because this is ridiculous. Like that's revolutionary. 
excuse me. So to be able to recognize that the oppression and injustice that exists in this country and make a revenue revolutionary statement that we need to have racial justice, but not only that, but but people of African descent are the people of the eye and no one else has a station. You know, indigenous peoples also in the Baha'i writings are told that they can be so illumined to enlighten the, the whole world. So this idea of light, the inherent light of spirit in, people, in peoples and communities who are the most oppressed, there's a spiritual divine significance, right? So it makes me think of that nobility, that people who are so oppressed systematically, physically, socially, economically, but also spiritually have this inherent status and station that no one else has. And so within the Baha'i context, there's this idea that the soul does not have a gender, it doesn't have a race, it doesn't have an ethnicity, right? The Universal House of Justice is the international governing body of the Baha'is of the world. And in a letter dated March 2nd, 2013, they wrote to the Baha'is of Iran, this long letter and this excerpt in particular, with, to give some context, was this idea of when you engage in this, you know, in the discourse of society and also the inequalities in society, remember this, that the rational soul has no gender, race, ethnicity, or class, a fact that renders intolerable all forms of prejudice, not the least of which are those that prevent women from fulfilling their potential and engaging in various fields of endeavor, shoulder to shoulder with men. And so this, this idea that we have this inherent nobility, the soul or the spirit is the most noble phenomenon. Justice is the quality of it, injustice is not. And that it has no gender, it's, it's just kind of like this spiritual true reality to kind, kind of think about it within this issue of, of difficulty, right? And I won't read this quote, um, but it's kind of an extension of the quote before and how there is gender equality or sex equality in nature and in animal life and plant life. I even was fascinated by the fact that there's a male fig tree and a female fig tree, but it makes sense. The female fig tree bears fruit, figs, and the male fig tree does not, it just bears leaves, like it doesn't bear fruit. And so the fact that there are even sexes or genders in nature and plant and animals, and they don't have the same complications like inequality, inequity, and patriarchy like we do, right? In a social way, they have it in a, um, a survival way, but we don't need to have a patriarchy to survive, you know, within the, within the human context. So thinking about this idea that it is last sentence, man endowed with this higher reason compared to plants and animals, accomplish in attainments and comprehending the realities of things will surely not be willing to allow a great part of humanity to remain defective or deprived. This would be the utmost injustice. And so oftentimes, like when people hear that I have put PhD, I actually ask my students to call me doctor in class. And even in my syllabus, I have doctor and I put, I hyperlink it to an article about why I like to be called doctor. I've heard a lot of people make comments about the fact that you don't need a degree to talk about this or that. And I agree, but just to clarify, I'm not showing off my degree either. People who look like me, people, other women of color are often told that you don't belong in academia. And I study academia, I study higher education. That's one of the things that I study. Higher education, the Euro-American model was designed by a white man for white men. Education is gendered. My husband is a middle school teacher. So he teaches eighth grade now. The kindergarten level through high school is gendered feminine. So if you're an educator in, you know, in the K through 12 level, education is, or educators are seen as feminine. That's seen as a for, feminine form of education. So educators are treated as they have to spread themselves thin. They have to bend over backwards and do things without pay a lot of labor comes out of it and you get paid very little. You're exploited a lot. And my husband and I have these conversations all the time about being one of the few men. And this is in the United States context. In a lot of countries, like when I, when I lived in Zambia, it's seen as a position of prestige to be a teacher. And it was very male dominated. 
So a lot of parts of the globe that see education with more value and prestige are often led by men and even at the K through 12 level. So it's interesting how patriarchy comes to play, right? There's not many women who are teaching or very slowly things are changing because I know it's changing more and more in Zambia. I have friends who have gone through teacher training and are now educators. So it's not generalized, but there are norms. There are normalized ways of how, you know, um, teaching or education is gendered. But then when at that higher ed level, at the academia level, it's gendered male, it's gendered masculine, and it's white masculine dominated. So when I say I have a PhD, it's not because I'm showing it off. It's saying, please stop erasing me. It's a statement to say that it is actually not mine, it is ours. I received that PhD after a lot of hard work, a lot of obstacles because of a community of support. So it wasn't mine alone. So when I put that PhD, it's a badge of honor and pride and gratitude of commitment to um, unyielding, you know, in just, unyielding commitments to, to justice, selflessness, to love, to community building, to constructive resilience. So I, I don't use that PhD to show that I'm better or higher than anyone. But I have heard people make comments that, including women, to say that you don't need to have a degree. And I've hope I've never offended or rubbed even any of you to say, to shove or rub my PhD in your face to be like, I'm better than you were above you because that was not my intent. And so I share that with this with this context of I don't know if people are familiar, but just in December, um, Joseph Epstein. A white man wrote an, wrote an opinion piece in the, um, the Wall Street Journal and it caused an uproar. He basically said, can you please drop the doctor? And look at, if you even see how he addresses um, First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, this is the first opening paragraph of the article. Madam First Lady, Mrs. Biden, Jill Kiddo, a bit of advice on what may seem like a small, but I think is not an unimportant matter. Any chance you might drop the doctor before your name, Dr. Jill Biden? So there's this like cheekiness. It's very inferior. It's very inferiorizing and fantasizing, right? And it's very patriarchal. It's basically a posture of entitlement. One white man saying to a white woman, drop the doctor. And he goes on to talk about how he worked at a university and he received an honorary doctorate and how PhDs people who have earned PhDs aren't hard workers. There is a very, if you are a woman of color in particular, who is underrepresented in the academy, you better believe that you worked really hard to get to where you're at because all the forces within higher education are working against you, right? So unless you have some certain privileges that have come in through connections and whatnot, it is to be in an academic space, like I said, is a perfect microcosm of society. And just to share, you know, like people talking about the fact that they make they made tenure to get full professor and being out of 2,900 black full professors in the United States, there are 315 full professors, right? So think about the percentages. That's like 0.001%. And this idea of why people are saying, call me doctor, right? And how in the UK, UK, the UK has actually in the UK, the number of black professors and some of them have left because so the number has actually dropped since this article came out is the fact that, and I only know because I know them personally, but this idea that, you know, if the academic space is not built and designed for us, we're not going to stay here, right? And that's what a few scholars in, in New Zealand did the who are Maori and Pacifica talking about how even as indigenous women, we are making less even than indigenous men. Indigenous men are making 65% less than non-indigenous people, right? Non-Maori, Maori or Pacifica. And so thinking about the fact that you have an article come out where a, a white scholar professor defends colonialism and says that it was justified and that it was a good thing and there's good things coming out of it. And this was actually attacked and it was retracted. As you'll notice, there's a withdrawal notice there. And there's this idea of also white women in South Africa 
who were predominantly Afrikaners from the you know Dutch Boer tradition who wrote an article that said that colors, colored women and colored women is a classification for a racial classification in South Africa for people who are mixed and not knowing what they're mixed with. So it's also a race, it's a racist name, but it's stuck. So even people from the so-called color community use the term color and it's become a very cultural term and some people actually resist it and don't use it. So it's by choice. But in this article, they say that alcoholism is inherently a part of colored, colored culture in South Africa, right? So again, another retracted article. These ideas of how people perceive society in the world is manifesting and reflecting in their work. And, you know, Andrea Ritchie, who wrote Invisible No More, she studies how women in the criminal and justice system often their experiences with police are flanked in the shadows of men. The amount of women, transgender, LGBTQIA, and non-gender conforming and two-spirit people who are assaulted and harassed by police are often unreported. And so they're not as mediatized, which also means that they're not as visible, right? So she argues at this point that we need to visibilize them more. She also argues that women of color are being, and women of gender minorities are being incarcerated at a faster rate than men are, but that's also not being recorded, right? And so Miliwe mentioned this idea of sexual violence and assault. If you read uh, the amazing work of Pumla Deneo, maybe Miliwe can help me with the pronunciation because of course I don't want to butcher it. It's the, <laughs> but this idea of, of rape and how it's become so normalized in South Africa and how actually just over the past year, couple years, how violence against women and sexual violence against women in particular has escalated dramatically, even within weeks and months, right? And I like, I don't wanna go into everything, but I wanted to talk about, you know, Sarah Deer also talks about the rape committed um, and the role of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls that is not being covered. It's mostly indigenous women who are advocating for the missing murdered indigenous women, you know, which is a phenomenon that a lot of people have not, police have not reported it. So indigenous communities are actually keeping their own databases of all missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and two-spirit peoples because police don't have the resources on tribal lands and also the US government or local police departments are not really, they don't really care about the issue. And so they haven't really been engaging with this idea of missing and murdered indigenous women. There's also Christina Sharps in the wake where she talks about this idea of how violence, premature black death is normalized and how that has a huge disproportionate impact on black women and children. She also talks about the idea of black women's flesh and how it was used since the time of slavery as a portal of reproducing blackness. So she says that the black, she says the, the womb, she talks about this idea of how blackness is produced from womb to tomb and how the, the birth canal is similar to the idea of the middle passage, right? As soon as women who are enslaved are giving birth and or who are raped, their children become properties of the, um, of the masters, they become enslaved. So this idea of how black women's bodies are being used in this way through a figurative birth canal, right? But also a literal one, this idea of the middle passage being paralleled with that is really powerful. Empire of Care by Choi is this talk about how Filipino nurses, why, is, why are there so many Filipino nurses right in the United States? And it wasn't until the sixties that the feminist movement emerged, especially white, you know, white feminist movement, but the feminist movement emerged in, you know, the United States. And there was a shortage of women wanting to go into nursing. And the United States did not want male nurses, right? So what did they do? They developed health centers in the Philippines. They even said it was, it was also because the Philippines was basically a colony of, it doesn't call it a colony, but it was a colony of the United States government. This idea that Filipino people are unclean, they are not, you know, they are not, they are uncivilized and savage and therefore we need to civilize them by giving them health training. So these health centers were developed and established in the Philippines teaching 
women English, but also nursing. They were trained as nurses. Men were dissuaded from participating, right? And so more on this, I wanna share, but how does this relate to the pandemic? I'm sorry, I noticed the time and like, I just wanna say, are people good or should I keep going or should I just stop? Cause I'm okay with whatever you all decide. I know people are zoomed out and I don't blame you because it's not nice to sit behind the screen. So I'd appreciate any verbal feedback or textual feed chat feedback. Going please, those who want to or have to leave can leave. Okay. Just so you know, I will have to end the meeting at 1245 because I have another meeting starting at one. Okay, no problem. I'll try to end way before that. Thanks. Okay. I'm gonna try my best to do that. So really quickly, I'm gonna brush through examples of like how the pandemic gives us a tiny glimpse of some of these examples of the intersection of, of race and gender, ethnicity, geography. So there's a lot of statistics out there with regards to the pandemic in terms of which communities are being the most targeted, especially in the United States, right? And it's very clear that indigenous communities and black or Af um, communities of African descent are disproportionately affected. But there's also this notice with regards to Asian, Latino, and white. So the white and Pacific Islander is very close. It's because the figures they have are very limited. And again, these are five-year estimates and it's not completely accurate. These are more in terms of, you know, estimates, right? But I was confused because knowing that before the pandemic hit, there are these vast, you know, differences and disparities with regards to how gender, you know, there's gender health based health disparities across racial and ethnic groups. Why isn't gender addressed? And I researched and researched and researched and still there's no research done on looking at the intersections of gender and race and ethnicity in the United States, which I think is problematic because it's not disaggregating the data enough. It's if you look at people within racial ethnic groups, it makes you wonder how many of those people, you know, based on what their genders are, how it becomes even more evident and visible in terms of who's being affected, right? At the same time, there are people who are affected in non-quantitative ways. For example, there are studies that have been done in Ethiopia, Rwanda, Vietnam, the United States, China, about how women who, when they lose a child or a loved one, also endure major health detriments because of mental emotional distress, right? And so these, these kind of factors, there's, there's studies about transgender, non-gender conforming people who are targeted just because they do not fit a category within society that is normalized, right? Or that is dominant. So these, like what, where are those numbers? Why, why are those not visible? Especially when there's so much that shows with regards to this idea of the history of this country in terms of land and violence and genocide and slavery and sexual violence and rape and all these things. LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, her soul descended actually yesterday. She passed away yesterday of brain cancer. A very staunch advocate, a Lakota, a Lakota you know, agent of change who was very much active in the Dakota pipeline, but also in this quote reminds us that because the indigenous understanding of land and earth as feminine, and a lot of traditions look at earth as feminine, even I looked up the Persian goddess for nature is feminine as well. This idea of looking at land as feminine, the violence committed against the land, the displacement of peoples and the exploitation of the land for capitalist you know, gains is also represented in terms of the violence against women, right? So this, this parallel between gender and land and thinking about that. And then you have these countless killings of people by police, mostly people of African descent, but also just generally people of, people of color who come from underrepresented marginalized communities. And then we are reminded of the anti-Asian violence, right? That happens at disproportionately targeted women and including elderly women. So age was also one of the intersections that came at play, especially in the, you know, in the areas, the Bay Area in California, which is why it elicited a program, a volunteer program for people to escort Asian elders home after work. Because 
being immigrants and refugees who couldn't afford to, you know, stay home and still continue to work, they had this escort service to write to keep continuing to support them. And then we learn about the amplification of gender-based violence and inter intimate partner violence and domestic violence because of COVID, people are staying indoors and locked in, right? And there's this statistic that 73% of health workers around the globe are women. So they are the essential health workers that are on the front lines. And this includes majority of nurses, right? And people are not talking about this in terms of the ideas. Of course, the statistic here are, like doesn't include indigenous peoples, which is often an, an unfortunate trend of indigenous erasure. But based on what is available here, it shows that the number of women coming from, for example, Black and Latina groups, they have a much higher rate of unemployment, right, compared to white women. So looking at this idea of even how our employment, how our, you know, income, how issues of class and race and gender also intersect. And this is Joyce um, Echequan. And Joyce Echequan was actually video recording. She was a COVID patient at a hospital in Quebec, Canada. And she was recording her experience being at this hospital where nurses were saying about her in French, indigenous people are only, she's only good for two things, either sex or death. And they were saying this within her, of hearing distance to about her. And she was recording it and she was crying and she was devastated. Unfortunately, Joyce Ejiquan did not, did not survive. She passed away. And then we have Dr. Stephanie Moore in Indiana, who about a couple months later was also recording her, her experience in the hospital of not getting support as a COVID patient in Indiana. Again, recorded the, her whole experience, posted it online, and she also passed away. She did not survive. What happened after Joyce, actually just in about two weeks ago, a few weeks ago, now it's um, in just in March, another indigenous woman that was from the same, same nation as Joyce Echequan, who was unidentified at the time, she was also um, being treated at the same exact hospital that Joyce Echequan had recorded her racist encounter with these nurses. And these nurses were basically saying, oh, what's your name? We'll call you Joyce, mocking her to basically name her after the person, the indigenous woman that, that passed away before her. At this particular hospital and in, in hospitals across Canada, the, the medical teams, nurses, doctors, et cetera, who are predominantly white are well known for even having, you know, for gambling and guessing, you know, what's the alcohol level of this indigenous person? What's the alcohol level of that indigenous person? And they put in bidded money to assess how, you know, indigenous people's blood alcohol levels are. So the racism, the sexism, the even the misogyny of how you're treating people when you're supposed to be in a, in a position of care where people are vulnerable, right? And this idea of coming back to the Filipino nurses. So Filipino nurses only comprise 4% of the US population. But why is it that 31% of them, over 30% are, are the cause of the deaths from, of the nurses from COVID? Like what is going on? And research found that it's because Filipino nurses in particular, a lot of them come out of retirement to go back to serve their communities. But not only that, they're the ones that are often put at the front lines. And the question is why? Why are Filipino nurses being put at the front lines compared to other people, right? And the fact that male nurses were just, you know, were discouraged coming from the Philippines, the fact is it's all women. And you have all these stats of coming like refugee women in Lebanon, like the Syrian refugee crisis, right, in terms of what's happening with regards to women in particular and children in particular. And France just introduced an anti-separatism bill where, you know, they already, they already have a fine for wearing the hijab, but now they're implementing a fine for homeschooling, for allowing mothers to potentially accompany their children to go on field trips if they wear a hijab, right? Um, so some mosques, mosques are gonna be closed, but there's also a lot of gendered, you know, attacks in terms of this idea of head covering. And the question is, for example, this idea of nurses, are nurses, I'm not nurses, sorry, nuns, for example, 
are nuns also banned if they are walking in a public place? And these ideas of the fact that, yes, France has always had this history, but I think that's the issue with this argument of patriarch and racism and wanting to look at and invisibilizing people's nobility is it doesn't, it's not brand new. It's a historical process that we're still perpetuating and reinforcing today, right? And so, <clears throat> sorry. So examples of how people are responding to um, cons constructive resilience is this concept that a lot of within the Baha'i Baha faith that was introduced, but it's not unique and specific to the Baha'i faith. Constructive resilience is basically what it means is how are communities and peoples transcending through their oppression by doing something constructive to benefit themselves and their communities, right? And so these are some examples of what's happening within like, you know, native country in the United States and also in, in um, Australia, for example, where people are advocating for the rights of, of women. There's the missing and, Mid missing and murdered indigenous women's reports. These are the two volume reports where people are systematically doing reports and trying to educate people, right? And Deb Holland, if had she not had it not been for Indigenous women alone, had it not been Indigenous women alone, you know, working so hard, Deb Holland would not have been um, nominated and elected as secretary. They did so much hard work on the ground, and their Indigenous um, male counterparts have very much expressed that, including their Two Spirit counterparts. Deb Helen also recently adopted uh, and sponsored a new um, authorization to the Violence Against Women Act so that Indigenous women could be more centered, you know, in the current bill. So because the current bill is very much, like I said, is very marginalized still, but there's still ideas in terms of how to include and be more inclusive for Indigenous women. And again, violence against women, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in Australia, for example, people are also advocating for that. So there's a lot of stuff happening on the ground. If you haven't watched the film Coded Bias, which is showing on Netflix right now, it was created by women about a lot of women who helped uncover the fact that algorithmic um, algorithms in, you know, on the internet and in machine learning and in artificial intelligence are very biased, you know, that they are leaning towards a very specific gendered way, but also very racialized, that it was designed by white men for white men. So if anyone wants to watch it, I think it's a great example of constructive resilience about how women have been working and advocating, informing government, helping, you know, uh, influence policy, but also changing the discourse in terms of how people design, you know, technology and computer things like that. So it's something to, to just like think about this idea. And I love the fact that it centers women of color in particular, but the fact that it's a very important, it, all, it mostly centers women. And why is it that women are the ones who detected this and not men? And I think it's very telling because even, um, the fact that the patriarchal undertones of the design of, you know, algorithmic bias is really interesting, right? And so I, there's this interesting note from the Universal House of Justice, which is again, the international governing body, talking about people of African descent in particular and how like the, you know, this idea of constructive resilience knowing about the intractable history of African Americans in the United States and the anti-Blackness in the United States, that they should continue to see in the recent turmoil opportunity rather than obstacle and not look at the oppression that they currently face as the end, you know, the end all, the be all, right? And so these are some examples of constructive resilience. I won't get into them too much because of time, but I do, this is to say that there are other examples in the world of how people are engaging with constructive resilience in terms of finding constructive ways to transcend oppression, acknowledge the oppression, but still transcending as communities to move through it and not allow it to make us stagnant or paralyzed as damaged, right? This kind of, this kind of idea. And one thing that Derek Smith's article 
My brother Derek Smith wrote this beautiful article on centering the pupil of the eye and how speaking of black labor, like Christina Sharp, not like ma maternal labor, but also this idea of, and we've talked about women's labor um, with regards in the context of the pandemic, but also this idea of how black labor in particular very much shaped development or modernization in the United States, even though modernization and development is often attributed to whiteness and to patriarchy and to the global north, right? But not to those who were enslaved to help build. And so, um, and this quote by Imani Perry is really great. She talks about this idea in the article that posted in the Atlantic about identifying the achievement and exhilaration in black life is not to mute or minimize racism, there is a spiritual majesty of joy and suffering and an invitation to not only possibly feel black pain, but also the beauty of being human. So this idea of nobility as a form of humanizing, right? And one of the former members of the international governing of the Baha'is of the United, of the Baha'is of the world, the Universal House of Justice, Dr. Farzam Arbab talks about how this idea of nobility, a striking aspect of Baha'i belief is the extraordinary optimism it displays about humanity's future. Such hopefulness would be untenable were it not for a profound conviction, which arises from the faith teachings that the human being was created noble. So the fact that thinking of nobility as an intergenerational sustainable future forward thinking kind of approach is also very promising to move beyond this concept of damage and victimhood and trauma. And I end with that. So thank you all for staying on as long as you did. And I appreciate your patience and, and being here. So, and if anyone wants to, I know Liz, you have to go in a few minutes and I understand, but I can stay on for anyone who wants to still engage in conversation. Perfect. Um, before I go, I just want to thank you and I hope everyone will, will join me in thank, thanking Dr. Satarzade for for her wonderful presentation. I know I was mind blown many, many times. So <laughs> thank you. It's, um, it's so wonderful to really bring these topics out into the open. And um, it was my hope that we would be able to create these spaces and have open conversations of, about gendered abuse and intersectionality. And so thank you for that. I really appreciate it. All right, so maybe we can move on to questions and I'll just excuse myself in a couple minutes. And the questions could be for everyone. They don't have to just be for me, because like I said, I'm not all knowing. <laughs> but I will see for questions. If people have to leave, that's totally fine. And I thank you all for coming and for being here. It's so lovely to see your faces and your names and hear your voices, you know, depending on what you've shared in the space but i just send my love to all of you so thank you for being here if you have to go i totally understand i jibba jabba too much and i apologize for that um could i ask a question please um the intersectionality can you talk to me just a little bit so i understand that concept intersectionality is that where the different people come together or is that something separate? Would I mean- someone, Would someone like to answer it with help? Can you I, know- um, Like what is intersectionality? What is an example of intersectionality? Yes. I'll get it from there, I think. I okay, think Sharon knows. Offering, yes, thank you. Well, I don't know if I know, I have an opinion. Okay. <laughs> and uh, an example would be that uh, I'm African American and I'm female, so there are some um, intersections oh. about that in my life that come out in different ways. Okay. Mm. Mm. <laughs> right. So there's this idea that if you, if you know, a white woman, as a white woman, Carolyn, and <laughs> The, the opportunities and even the way that society perceives in general, Sharon, you're both women, but because Sharon is a black woman, society views her at a more disadvantaged way. Women are already viewed in a disadvantaged way, but then you add on the aspect of race and it's another layer, right? 
it could be that, however, Sharon comes from a wealthy, wealthy, um, you know, family and also lives in a wealthy community and neighborhood. And so that's another form of intersection, right, is your class. And so all these basically intersections are different points of identity and their relationship to the greater forces in society. The problem is when people separate them from the forces of society and say, oh, I, you know, I am, um, I'm bipolar and I have, um, I am <laughs> poor and they, and you say these things, but you also don't connect to the fact of how society treats and stigma, stigma, stigmatizes mental health, for example, or how it stigmatizes race, right? So intersectionality requires us to interrogate those multiple identities and its relationship to the greater society and why some people are more privileged than others and why it also perpetuates injustice and oppression because of those various identity points, right? Mm -hmm. There's a something uh, from Facebook, I'm a real scholar here, <laughs> that says, in order to love, you have to get closer. So that's why I was wondering if that had to do with intersectionality, but it's not the same. It's, it, you're looking at the negative side of things, of reality, right? But in order to move towards the positive side, we have to learn to get closer. I mean, I, I get close to people because I'm a doctor. I got an advantage there. You know, people talk to me um, and I ask questions and try to find out what they're going through. So they know I love them and actually they think I love them more than I really do. But and I figure that's God giving me a little advantage there. But it's hard for me to cross racial lines here in, in my county because people are very conscious. They're also very conscious of religion. So uh, that's a different kind of intersection when you get to a place like a, a House of Justice says, go where you're a little uncomfortable, you know? There's some advantage to doing that. Maybe that's the resilience that you've been talking about that gives you resilience. Uh, I'm, I'm done, thanks. <laughs> no, thank you. I think there's, you know, intersectionality is not always, it's not necessarily seen as a negative, but the way that society works it works against, there are forces at play that work against certain um, for certain identities, right? Like black men, for example, the fact that disproportionately police brutality by white men against black men is an example of toxic masculinity of how white men perceive black men in relation to them, right? So it's this patriarchal force, but how would they do the same with a white man? And there's a lot of videos you will see, like in also oh, yeah. media, where the diff the interactions are different, and it's not in it's not that those identities are negative, as people should be ashamed of having those intersections. It's more that the way that society labels and also looks, you know, perceives them and therefore acts upon that, right? And um, to go somewhere somewhere where you're not comfortable, I think it also has to make sure that we're cautious of this idea of paternalism where we're going into communities and neighborhoods and spaces as guests thinking that we can have this savior thinking, right? Because the savior thinking, I don't know if people have seen the film Hidden Figures, for example, you know, this really great film. Well, I wouldn't say great film, great truth. Like I'll say the fact, like the fact that these amazing African-American women and their role in the NASA program, right? And in terms of their knowledge in math and science and technology, which was very much erased and invisibilized. And, and this, this book that was written brought it to the fore. But in the movie, there's a scene where Kevin Costner's character, the white supervisor, goes to the bathroom sign and knocks it down with a hammer to basically say, oh, she, you know, because they were taking long trips to go to the colored bathroom right? The, the, it was in a completely different building far away on the other side of the compound. And then you have this savior character, Kevin Costner, breaking down the sign to saying, you can go to the bathroom right here. That never really happened. But Hollywood still feels like it needs to inject 
certain narratives, right, that center white patriarchy or white manhood or this kind of savior. So this idea of going where it's uncomfortable, I think it's important to go in spaces where you're uncomfortable, but not for the sake of, um, not for the sake of paternalism or, you know, surface level, cosmetic level, in genuine kind of intentions kind of thing. Sorry, Hoda, I know you've had your hand up for a while. Go ahead. I'm so sorry, this is my second question. Thank you for taking it, but it's really only a request. If you would consider, and I was hoping that Liz would consider hosting an event when you speak about intersectionality of race and gender um, from an Iranian perspective, in terms of you speak about the BIPOC, Blacks, Indigenous, and people of color, but if you would only specifically talk about from like a, a, a Baha'i, an, an Iranian woman in terms of um, your interactions, in terms of any academic information that may be out there, because I think there's a tremendous need. I have not heard it. I'm always searching for it. And it would be a great, um, really benefit a large number of not just Iranians, but other people who live in communities where they have many other Iranians and they don't, they're perplexed by the lack of engagement or, um, uh, yeah, true, I'm gonna use the word lack of engagement and participation and to step, step up in this issue of race and diversity, which is so central and pivotal to, the, to building communities of the oneness of humanity. Thanks for sharing that. I'm actually working on something that focuses exactly on that. And with and there's always, you know, when you're talking about your own community, there's always this fear or caution of offending people and um, and rubbing the wrong way. And even the fact that, like you mentioned, of sharing something that is very taboo in a lot of cultures and communities, even oftentimes within the Baha'i spaces, right? People don't talk about these things very openly. Um, and so what like a lot of people who know me know I love art from around the around the world and especially when it comes from the communities themselves and it's not replicated by certain people and one thing I really love is Persian rugs and Iran like carpets and I think they're beautiful and I love them they're so expensive right especially when when they're imported and one thing that was really interesting to me is speaking of labor is it's a very gendered, segregated, gendered like role in terms of how Persian rugs and carpets are made. You know, men are the ones who shear all the wool off the, you know, in order for preparation. The women are the ones who spin the wool. The men are the ones who dye it. And the women are the ones who basically weave the carpet. I'm like, oh, okay, really balanced in terms of who has the, you know, the, the more complex, but, when you look at rugs, you never think that women's hands created this carpet. You're never thinking about that. The labor is completely erased and invisibilized, but it's mostly predominantly only women who are doing it. It's gendered, you know, even in that kind of idea, but people have them in their homes, right? It's seen as this luxury, this, you know, luxury item. And even in my own family, I've experienced a lot of things, extended relatives, I should say, in terms of the intersections of you know, skin complexion or beauty and in terms of gender roles and those kind of things. I've encountered a lot of that and I have a lot to share, you know? I could I could happily share without exposing um, things about family that my, maybe my parents don't want to be, to be exposed, but like also to the point of just keeping it real at the same time, right? And not sugarcoating. You know, there's a book that an Iranian wrote um, called the limits of whiteness, but she doesn't integrate, interrogate gender at all. And, you know, there's a lot of people who don't interrogate gender in this context. So yeah, I would be happy to, to share more, even coming from a personal, but it's also by talking about this stuff is also my resistance to those, those kind of stereotypes and norms as well, right? This idea that I am not an exotic, I am not an other, and I am just not a nobody. And I'm also don't think I'm superior to you either, just because, you know, I have and those kind of things. So. But thanks. Thanks for that comment. Thanks once again for just just you <laughs> and who you are. Um, and I, I just want to comment that um, since I have been a Baha'i for a very long time, that doesn't mean I'm more spiritual or better. But anyway, it's just true in my case. Um, and that uh, <laughs> many, you know, several 
of the Baha'i Iranian women that I know, the impact of uh, weaving and all that on their hands and bodies, especially the hands and the trauma to that is something that I don't think is well known. It has impact on women. Mm. Yeah, that's why I think the idea of figure, like there's labor in terms of work, but then there's labor in terms of as motherhood, as care, right? As being, um, as being a holder and carrier of, you know, of, of life. And all these ideas of how that also takes a toll, like you said, right? This not only physical, but emotional, psychological, there's a lot of carry. You know, I have this conversation with my husband often and the argument is, uh, you know, as um, a Brit Jamaican, as he identifies, he identifies as a Brit Jamaican, born in London, Jamaican parents and moved to the United States at 13, has so many horrible, horrific stories of encounters with police. Um, but when we talk about this idea of like the toll that uh, that alone takes on black women or mass incarceration, it's difficult for him to comprehend, to conceive because he's so stuck in the experiences that he's had and knowing about so many friends and relatives and cousins you know, from people back home who are no longer alive, right? Who are incarcerated, that it's difficult to still see how that ha also has an impact on mothers and daughters and sisters and cousins and grandmothers, right? So it's, it's just really interesting in terms of what it takes to understand that it's not only this idea of interracial, but intra as well. And I think that that toll of labor and how it manifests in many forms. So thanks for sharing that. Charles, I might get into oh, trouble sorry. for this. Sorry? I might, get into, I might get into trouble for this, but since we're all good friends now, <laughs> um, the, um, you know, the way that it impacts a lot of African, in this case, African-American women, is that it has a tendency to masculinize more African-American women to be out there in front more than what is normal and natural thing. And the consequence of that is, is, is extraordinary because the women, we as African-American women, we have more privileges because we're not the target of racism. It's the males, the, the black males that are the target. And so we have more privileges in certain ways that really imbalance the relationships and who we are and who we want to be from a feminine perspective. I just had to say it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Yes, Charles, please. Um, first Lovely. of all, it's so good to see you. <laughs> Lovely to see you as well. So happy to see your face here. <laughs> Thanks. I, I just wondered if, uh, if you had an, another tip that you would like to share regarding the, like a, a daily practice. You mentioned about uh, recognizing in the morning or doing certain things in the morning to recognize your nobility. Um, any other things you've thought of that, uh, that you find might be helpful with, with that process? I would love to hear what other people think, you know, as well to answer that question. And even you as well, Brother Charles, in terms of what answers, you know, you have. When I, because it's easy to recite something and memorize it, but then to actually believe it and to act upon it is a different thing, right? And the reason why it was so profound for me to even get that lesson was because I was so focused on justice outside of myself and like that I forgot about justice for myself the whole time. And that's when I realized this idea of nobility was missing the sense of recognizing that nobility. So I always believe in the power of meditation. However, people practice meditation, whether it's through walking or, you know, saying prayers or um, through poetry or journaling. I think affirmations like also acknowledging your own nobility, but also saying it to loved ones and people that you know are, are also having difficulties with recognizing their own nobility. Because when we share that encouragement with others, it also is a reminder to ourselves as well. Um, and I think also doing deeds, like forcing us to do deeds for ourselves to practice that nobility. I, you know, my university, for example, did not have a spring break. 
and I could see the fatigue in my students. And I was also feeling overwhelmed because I've been taking a, a lot um, of responsibility during my first year, maybe more than I should have. And I said, I'm just going to give a week off. And something so simple as giving a week off to students is an act of nobility because I'm giving myself time, but also recognizing that they need a break, right? So I think there's so many different answers based on what your context and your experiences in terms of, and people, if you have, if anyone, you know, here has thoughts to share, I think people have more creative, innovative ideas. I do like, you know, spoken word and I do artsy graphic stuff on the side sometimes as a form of, of release. And, um, but also just connecting with your network. Like uh, my sisterhood has been really helpful in terms of helping me and also just connecting with loved ones. So any, any exercise or practices that people wanna share in the chat or even out loud to help answer this important question of what are practical ways to practice nobility. And also unlearn, unlearning, because of the PTSD diagnosis, unlearning is a form of recognizing my own nobility, right? Like not talking about myself in a negative way. Um, and those kind of things and checking myself before I do. And even also other people, if they say, I'm so dumb. And even just catching that and saying, no, you're not. You are not dumb, mm -hmm. don't say that. You know, something so simple. I was reading this book called Treating PTSD in Battered Women. And I hate the title. I, I think it's really problematic. Um, yes. It has a whole other, it has a whole bunch of things in it, but it was saying, it has a, a whole, whole bunch of activities. And one of them was monitoring your negative self-talk. And ever since then, I've kind of been cognizant of stop talking about myself in a negative way and saying, I'm actually noble. And so I need to recognize that and act accordingly and treat myself more justly. If justice is so important to me, it has to also begin with the self. Otherwise, I can't be just to people genuinely, right, externally. So if other people have answers to that, I think I would love to. Thanks for that question. It's such a good question. Yeah, that was very helpful. I, oh, uh, is it <laughs> oh, <clears throat> I'd like to say that, um, first of all, thank you again so much for this, this very um, needed and very revealing conversation that we're having. And <clears throat> Excuse me, I have sinus problems. Um, since the world is going through its continuous growing pains and we're all suffering from the ills that we've put into the world by our actions and deeds, <clears throat> the idea of nobility is an excellent one and one that one of my family members needs to be, also has a PTSD also needs to uh, have a greater understanding of um, when Baha'u'llah says for us to bring ourselves to account each day. To me, it means after prayer, in the process of meditation, uh, he also says that I have created the noble, like you said, that we we, we begin to think of ourselves in, on a higher level in a relationship with, with our creator. And in taking yourself to account doesn't just mean looking at all the negative things that have happened in the day, but it also means recognizing your nobility and the things that God would say, well done, my child. And so the things that we participate in and the things that our relationship with others, we're more conscious of. Because we know at the end of the day, when we take ourselves into account, we want to have a better record that we've made some progress. Because we all fail at times, but we can always climb again. And he also well, that's it. I'm not going to talk anymore. <laughs> I like that, too. Yeah, I think it's, thank you for sharing, Baba. I think it's you remind us that the, like it's the capacity of the soul and it doesn't mean you're gonna get it perfect because the human is still there. And so the fact that you have this capacity, your soul has this capacity to be able to train yourself to, is going to be lifelong. 
and it won't end, you know, after 